sometimes when life gets hard, I say, surgery without anesthesia. Greetings. This is The Filter with Matt Asher. My guest today is A.J. Jacobs. A.J., welcome to The Filter. Thank you, Matt. Delighted to be here. Great to have you here. So usually I begin with a bio for my guest, but I want to start out our conversation with a personal story for reasons that should become clear. In the late 90s, I was living in Seattle. I dropped out of journalism school after previously dropping out of engineering school. (laughs) At that point, in my mid-20s, I'd worked for a magazine and run two free weekly publications, both of which had failed. And I was looking for a new project. Uh, A friend and future author and now past filter guest Jesse Walker told me about an idea called the Religion of the Month Club. So it worked like this. Each month, at the beginning of the month, you pick a new religion. You get deeply involved with that religion. You read their Bible, you go to their services, you become a true believer. By late in the month, your faith reaches a fever pitch, (laughs) but then doubt creeps in, and by the end of the month, you've become a complete apostate just in time for the next month and the next religion. So I I thought that idea was brilliant, and my plan was to do this for a year and keep a weblog of the experience, which is what you did if you lived in Seattle in the late 90s. Uh, And then at the end of the year, I was going to turn all of those writings into a book. I, I picked Mormonism for the first month, and I dove right in. To truly experience life as founder Joseph Smith intended, my plan was to acquire several wives along the way. (laughs) Uh, I had some candidates in mind. I only made it to one wife during that month, and uh, our marriage uh, outlasted my Mormon uh, phase by about 15 years. We have a daughter together. Congrats. Thank you. Congrats. Uh, But after that first month of Mormonism, I only made it about halfway into Scientology before throwing in the towel on that project. (laughs) Not long after that, I began noticing your articles in Esquire magazine, including the one where you try and outsource all the parts of your life to an offshore assistant. And then I read your book, The Know-It-All, The Main subject of today's conversation. Uh, For that book, you spent a year reading the full Encyclopedia Britannica, 23 dense volumes, 33,000 pages, in an attempt to acquire all the knowledge. Now, a handful of books later, you are one of a few highly successful authors, along with people like Tim Ferriss, who've made a career out of experimenting with their own life. You took the path I backed away from, and (laughs) you excelled at it. Uh, For my own part, I'm not in the least bit disappointed with the direction my life has taken, and there's been plenty of experimenting, for sure. But I must say, every now and then, I imagine the A.J. Jacobs version of myself out there, and I wonder about that alternative timeline. (laughs) I love it. Well, thank you. And yes, I did a version of the... Uh, Religion of the Month Club, I did a a book called The Year of Living Biblically, where I followed all the rules, mostly of the Old Testament. And I also tried to dabble in polygamy, because the Old Testament, uh, polygamy is absolutely fine. Uh, David had something like 12 wives. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I wasn't sure why you needed the additional concubines if you have 700 wives. But I did think of doing a little polygamy. I called the head of the Polygamy Association in the U.S., who is a um, sort of a far-right religious Christian. And he, I said, it's an interesting idea, but how do I, how do I go about it? Uh, and he said, Ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So go out, marry another woman, bring her back to your current wife and say, hey, I'd like you to meet your new co-wife. And he said, that has a better chance of working. Uh, But I, I made the mistake of asking for permission and I did not get it. 
<laughs> imagine what the future would have been like uh, had you gotten it, I suppose. <laughs> right. well, probably a nightmare. I, I mean, I actually don't like the idea of polygamy for myself. I don't. Uh, polyamory is fine ethically. I don't have an ethical problem with polyamory, but it just logistically sounds exhausting. It does seem like it would add complication to one's life, uh, and life right now in general is fairly complicated to begin with. Certainly one of the things I was interested in getting into, there's uh, lots and lots in your know-it-all book about, you know, about history. Looking back at it, one of the quotes that you have that I like a lot is that the more you look into something, the more diverse it is. I'm not sure I'm paraphrasing there. Here it is. There's always more diversity than you think. One of the things that I've had on my mind recently, it seems like our present era is a highly complex society. And I imagine there are times when things haven't been so complex. There are entire books about the collapse of complexity. But now that you've, I guess, poked in on various eras and time periods and places, does it seem like perhaps we overestimate the extent to which modern life is uh, complex just because we don't, you know, naturally know about all the other ways in which life has lived and all the other facets of culture that existed in the past? That's an interesting question. So you're saying that life was also complex in the past. We just don't appreciate how complex it was. I think that uh, that's something that I'm wondering about. And given that you, you know, having in the course of the, you know, the, the tens of thousands of entries that you read, you got a chance to see little facets of culture from the past and events and whatnot. Yeah. Does that give you a feel that perhaps, you know, that there might have been as much richness going on back there in terms of the things happening? Well, certainly uh, it's hard to quantify, but I agree with you in general that life has always been incredibly complex. And I liked what you talked about with Russ Roberts, who uh, is a friend of mine, that these simplifying narratives are often just that, overly simple and misleading. And the example Russ gave was the, um, the, the, the depression, that the narrative is that the New Deal and World War II fixed the depression. And... I'm no expert, so I don't know whether this is true or not, but apparently there are people who question that and say it's not so simple. And I would say that that is a big lesson that I learned then and that I hold dear now, is that simple narratives are often, maybe usually, misleading, and life is so much more filled with gray. And I have a section in the book, the know-it-all, on um, Max Schmeling, who I had heard of, and he's the Aryan boxer who Hitler touted as like the great white hope. He was supposed to represent how great the white people were. He got beaten by, I think it was Joe Lewis. So he's like an easy villain. He is like a horror, you know, he's Hitler's boxer. But the encyclopedia was actually interesting in that they gave a more nuanced portrait of him. Now, I'm not going to, he's not my hero. I don't have a poster of him. But he did shield Jewish people during Kristallnacht. He had a Jewish manager. And the Nazis actually uh, punished him for having sort of uh, close Jewish ties and, uh, and put him in a dangerous part of the army, the paratroopers. So he is... Uh, it's very hard to find pure villains and pure heroes in history. So that might be one example of complexity. For sure. Do you think that, you know, having read the, the whole encyclopedia and now looking at modern day events, that makes you more likely to reject the simple narratives of today? Or do you find you still can, um, like all of us, look at something and go, oh, that's terrible, that's pure evil, or, you know, oh, that's, those people are doing God's work without, you know, without applying perhaps the, the lessons uh, of, uh, of your readings? Well, yeah, it's always a struggle because that's the knee-jerk reaction. It's like, oh, this guy is terrible. This guy's a hero. But I do strive. I struggle to look at the nuances. In fact, I was I worked on a podcast, which I may or may never release, 
but it is uh, the premise was good or bad. And I would take a big topic like the Olympics or dogs or uh, uh, democracy, and I would try to go over how it might be good for society and how it might be bad for society. And the whole point was that everything has trade-offs. Everything is nuanced and complicated. Everybody who we consider a hero, there's always another side. Like Jonas Salk. I'm about to attack Jonas Salk, so uh, apologies to uh, people out there who are fans. Uh, and this I got from a great book by Adam Grant. But Jonas Salk, uh, of course, is held up as the hero who invented the polio vaccine. He is the man. But he didn't do it himself. There were six other people in the, his lab who were intimately involved. There was lots of work before him that made his work possible. And he, the, the easier narrative, people like one hero. They like a story where there's one person who did it, one maverick who uh, changed the world. But that's generally not how life works. It's mostly a cooperative effort uh, or there's lots of people overlapping. But who wants to see a Time magazine cover with like 14 scientists on it? You want to see that one hero scientist. Yeah, we like to have the the figurehead uh, for sure, the one symbol that embodies all of our love or hate for a particular thing or who is the singular hero or villain. Right. The polio thing is very interesting. I just happened to look into some of the story behind it recently, and I'd recommend people check it out. It is not at all as simple as the story we learn about there was polio, then there was a vaccine, and then there was the eradication of polio. It's a much more complicated and interesting uh, subject than that, which I guess gets to that idea that the deeper you dig, the more you see about how much the stories that were told is, is simplified. Can you give me a teaser of how it's more complicated? Just that what we see is the clarity about both the causes and the cure for polio turns out to be not so simple. And I'm not a, a doctor, so I wouldn't try to go into all of the aspects of that. I just recommend that if people are interested, they check that out as a as a, an example, perhaps, of the way in which narratives can get simplified over time. Got it. Actually, what about the reverse of that? I, there were a few times in the book when you mentioned things that you, you know, that you knew that the encyclopedia didn't or that they got <laughs> wrong. Were there any topics where you're like, there's so much more deep and interesting information than they covered in their entry? And I really wish they had gone much, much deeper about that. Well, I think that in retrospect, yes, uh, because whenever I see or read about something that has been covered in the encyclopedia, I remember the Children's Crusade has always stuck with me as this incredibly sad moment in history. I think it was the 13th century, and uh, allegedly thousands of kids went off on the crusade to the Middle East to conquer for Christianity. And and uh, they failed. They all got taken into slavery by people who were, you know, pretending to be on their side. I don't remember where I was reading about it. It's just, again, much more complicated. And we don't know really what happened. I think epistemic humility is one of my favorite themes. And this applies to everything, but especially the past, where we have such unreliable sources. So who knows what really happened with the Children's Crusade? It's been embellished and conflated and all sorts of things. So, so I guess my answer is a little paradoxical. On the one hand, I think that the encyclopedia was too definitive in their history, saying this is what happened when, in fact, we don't really know. And it was, and it's also too simple in that the, uh, the real story is much more nuanced. There's a couple books about 
the essentially the need for epistemic uh, humility, the the half life of facts, and then I think Cloisterman's "What if What if we got it all wrong?" Yes, like that, I think the title something like that. F- fun books, both right, and they between the two of them, they're kind of a one two punch about the ideas that the knowledge that we have is likely to turn out wrong in the end based on the past in which we've seen that the things we thought we knew turned out to be wrong. You know, having having read through everything you read, do you have a feel in your mind for how much of that, as you were absorbing it, is is likely to kind of stand the test of time in terms of what we know about the world? Well, I think there are a couple of areas that I want to distinguish. I do think that the generally humans have made progress in knowledge. And I do think that's mostly through science. Now, I, I'm well aware of the biases and problems and corruption in science. I'm reading a book called Science Fictions, which is all about the replication crisis and publication bias. Uh, but that said, I do think science is the best way to create a model that predicts future events. So uh, I, I don't want to say all knowledge is equally unreliable. So I am a fan of science. That said, I think that there's a lot of knowledge, especially like ethical knowledge that we take for granted, that people in the future will not believe that we held these beliefs. And I think about it often. What is the future slavery? What will 25th century humans, assuming there are some, look back and say, I cannot believe people did that. How cruel, how thoughtless. You know, what if I ever have a statue made of me, which I doubt I will, you know, why will they tear it down? And I have some theories. Uh, It's very hard to predict, but I do think industrial farming will be, uh, people will not believe that, uh, you know, we we treated animals this way. Even things, this one is a weird one, uh, but, you know, I have a woman who comes once a week and cleans my apartment, and hopefully in the future we'll have super Roombas, so everything will be done robotically, and future people will look back and say, I cannot believe the insensitivity that humans hired other humans to scrub their toilets. Like, what a horrible way to spend a life and how exploitative. So I would say, yeah, I have a lot of humility about my own ethics in addition to humility about other kinds of knowledge. I think that I will be both shocked and disappointed if within simply a matter of years we don't look back upon the lockdown approach to dealing with the current pandemic and shake our heads with a sense of astonishment at how crazy it was that we thought the solution to a virus was to lock everybody in their homes um, as time goes by, we're already beginning to see some of the horrible effects of that approach. And as time goes by, we'll see more and more. In the end, my suspicion is that that's one of the things that we're living through at this very moment that people will look back upon and go, what the hell were they thinking? But both custom and fear are huge motivators and is inertia, right? And you know, slavery has been a part of human history forever up until fairly recently in terms of the arc of of human history. Um, And, you know, and the effect of fear on people in terms of turning them against their fellow citizens is also, you know, a long historical precedent. There was the Japanese internment camps that we do now look back upon and go, that was insane and a crazy overreaction. It's tricky in the moment because in the moment you're relying on those two things, right? The inertia of past history that makes things that the future will look at as crazy seem normal just because it's what you've always done. And then whatever heightened emotions or passions you have in the present. I imagine too in the book there were lots of things that people believed or did that you read about. You had a hard time putting yourself inside the mindset of someone who could see this as a rational reaction or way to go, right? 
Yeah, for sure. First, I just want to address the uh, the shutdown because I want to plead a little more epistemic humility about whether this is the right path to go. I hear you that it, it, we may look back in 50 years and be like, what the hell were we thinking? You know, it would be great if we had an alternative universe where we just said life just keep going like Sweden's model and we sacrificed a few million people. Would that be a better world because it wouldn't cause such long term economic and other types of misery? I don't know the answer. You know, I think that the decision to shut down, it may be the right one. It may be the right one in the end that uh, even if we didn't shut down, then hospitals would be overwhelmed and and civilization would have come to a halt just voluntarily. I don't want to get too deep into that, but I just would say I'm very epistemically humble about what is the right path. I have not studied it enough to really have an informed opinion. Unless I got a PhD in ep epidemiology, I wouldn't have an informed opinion. So anyway, I just want to pop that in. But also, uh, yeah, I mean, it is hard to get into the the mindset of people in the past. It, there's, it, I, I do believe the past is a foreign country. And uh, I've been listening to a great podcast, well, not a podcast, it's a master class called uh, The Other Side of History. Uh, and it's all about the premises, instead of studying kings and aristocrats, this is all about what life was like for the average Joe, for the peon, the serfs. Again, it sucked. It was, it was pretty horrible. It was violent, smelly, you know, sexist, racist, all that. But one that struck me was the uh, section on Greek and Roman slavery and how no one, not even the most progressive thinkers in Greece and Rome, ever concluded that slavery was wrong. People would say, you know, treat your slaves better, and slaves who managed to get free would often just turn around and acquire slaves themselves. So it was they couldn't make the intellectual leap to see this is a horrible way to structure society because it was seen as so natural. This is like part of the the way the world is naturally ordered. The way it had always been and was. Right. Yeah, uh, unquestionably. Uh, there's so many things, it, but it, it's the air you breathe, right? It's hard to, to question that. It's hard to even see that. And then it's hard to put yourself in the place of someone who is just completely enveloped in a different culture for sure. I mean, oh, I don't want to cut you, but I, but it, it reminds me, I have a section in the book about uh, burial and showing how different societies buried people. And I never thought about the fact that you could bury people in different positions. You know, to me, the metaphor that death is the long sleep is so powerful that I'm like, of course you bury people lying flat on their back. But no, there were cultures that buried people standing up or in the fetal position because it's the long gestation. So this idea, like you said, we, it's the air we breathe. We don't even notice the, some of the assumptions that we have. There's a, a fun little book called Fate. The author talks about the ways in which the everyday metaphors we use shape how we view the mm. world, and that's certainly something that we don't think about. You know, one of uh, her lines is that you can, you know, you can live in Cincinnati or you can live in denial. <laughs> same, same, same expression, right? Mm. Or you know, the past, the past is always behind us. Yeah, uh, the future is ahead of us, and you can start with one simple metaphor like that that is spatial or whatever it is, and then you can see how it traces out uh, linguistically and in terms of our thinking in all the various ways that we talk about um, our lives as being ahead of us or the, the road ahead and just keep going and going with that metaphor and how it weaves its way through our lives and we just don't think about that. That's so interesting. I have a friend of mine who's publishing a book. It's not out yet. Uh, it's about the future and long-term thinking. And he talks about a some culture, a tribe, I think, in, in South America that's the only known culture that does not use 
the looking ahead metaphor for the future. They talk about looking ahead as the past because the past you can see relatively clearly. The future you can't see. You can't see. So why would we talk about looking ahead? And I just, uh, like you say, these filters are are so ingrained in the way we think um, that we don't even notice them. Are there are there any practices or filters or or, or ideas that you saw in the um, in the reading of the encyclopedia that you've carried forward with you uh, to this day, and you've thought, oh, that's a great one. I want to you know I want to keep that idea or concept or way of doing things with me. Well, for sure, I think there there are a few that hold up. You know, not not everything about the book I think holds up. The one we already talked about: how life is complex and filled with grays. Another is the idea that the good old days were not good, that nostalgia has a huge downside. And this is sort of the Steven Pinker thesis that life has gotten better and life used to be just, as I say, dangerous, smelly, diseased, violent, sexist, homophobic, you name it. I remember reading in the encyclopedia about um, surgery without anesthesia. And that is sort of a good three-word mantra that sometimes when life gets hard, I say surgery without anesthesia because it had some first-person accounts in the encyclopedia of people who had undergone surgery in the 18th century. And it is just so horrific that it kept me up for days. Now, I will say, since as we mentioned, everything is nuanced, I don't think it's so clear-cut that everything is better today like not every it's not a clear simple narrative and uh, two things come to mind one is yeah things have generally gotten better but we now have nuclear weapons and we have crispr that can engineer killer pandemics so this is not guaranteed to continue and second i don't think for instance i mentioned factory farming You know, I don't think life has gotten better for the average animal on Earth. It's gotten better for the average human, I think. But uh, there are there are other beings out there. One of the things you talk about in the book is obviously a a comprehensive encyclopedia or an attempt at comprehensive encyclopedia is going to have a lot of violence in it. Our history is is very violent, lots of brutality and other bad things happening. People often talk about what is the effect on kids of seeing so many gun shootings on TV or things like that. What do you think, if anything, was the effect on your brain of taking in (laughs) just so many entries that must have been filled with horrible things happening. That is true. Well, I think that is an interesting filter because I do think we are attracted as humans to the conflict and the violence in terms of story. But much of history was not violent. There was plenty of improvements, small incremental improvements in medical advances and etc. Uh, but those are not as good stories. You know, if you watch the History Channel, they're not going to show, oh, here was, uh, you know, this cooperative medical advance, the artificial hip that improved millions of lives. Uh, but that's not a very good History Channel documentary. Or, or you go to like the animal ones. Yes, nature is violent and red and tooth and claw, but not always. So when you watch a nature documentary, you want, you want to see the cheetah killing the zebra. Uh, you don't want to watch the hours of them grazing peacefully. That's not interesting. So I would say there, there is a little um, bias towards the violence and the horror. When I read about history, I try to balance that with, you know, a lot of it was just boring, either neutral or slightly positive, better than neutral people living their lives. So that was your way of coping with the onslaught of all of these violent stories was just to tell yourself, well, these are just the clips of the lion eating the zebra that I'm seeing and not, you know, the two of them lazing around uh, enjoying themselves. Uh, Yeah, that, I mean, in retrospect, that's my strategy. I don't know if I had that strategy at the time, Uh, but that's the story I'm telling. 
we talked a little bit about like uh, the way in which knowledge can be discovered to be wrong over time. How much do you think of what you consumed was not so much wrong as uh, outdated at this point? Like we're 15 years on how much of this is countries that no longer exist, mm. capital names that have changed and so forth and things that are just no longer relevant. That's a great question. And I think that was part of the half-life of facts, right? Isn't that part of the thesis of that book? That's one of the ways in which kind of information can decay is that things move on, um, countries cease to exist and, and so forth. And the things that were true uh, are no longer true, not because we've overturned a scientific theory, but just because time has marched on and, you know, the human civilization has changed. Right. I mean, I, I think I was certainly struck by that reading the older editions of the encyclopedia, like, uh, you know, the first edition in 1768, where California was an island, or even the whole tone of the 1911 edition of the encyclopedia, which is, which is known to enthusiasts as this sort of wonderful mythical literary version because it had Houdini writing about magic. It had Freud writing about psychoanalysis. It had all of these amazing people writing. But it was also, it had this tone of Steven Pinker on steroids, that the world was getting better and better and better. And we were sort of at the end of the dark ages and rationality had conquered everything. And then, you know, a few years later, World War I. And so it became clear that that was an over-optimistic reading of human nature. I, I'm trying to think of examples. Of, I haven't kept up with how the encyclopedia is covering the world now, but, I mean, we live in a different information landscape, so I'm sure they have had to adjust. And I think some of that is probably good. I do think there was probably a Western-centric angle on history in the encyclopedia. I will say, not totally. It was certainly one of the revelations that I had was how little I knew about, for instance, Asia and Asian history. Because I remember reading the section on the Taiping Rebellion, which I had barely heard of. But this was an extraordinary event in Chinese history. It was in the 1860s, about the time of our American Civil War, and it was sort of this Christian, charismatic cult leader who declared himself the second coming of Jesus and had millions of followers, and they declared civil war and almost overthrew the empire. And in that, according to the historians, and again, we should have epistemic humility, but according to historians, an estimated 20 million people died in the Taiping Rebellion. And in the U.S. Civil War, uh, I forget the estimates are around 700,000, I believe. So this is uh, multitudes more than people who were killed. And the fact that I knew tons about the U.S. Civil War and nothing about this Civil War, it, was, it struck me as very lopsided and strange. It's, it's very interesting how the, we seem to have these essentially collective black holes of knowledge about things that it would seem that everyone could agree are of huge impact, like the uh, Taiping Rebellion, which you mentioned. I see that, too, in the disparity between the amount we talk about, say, the Holocaust, which everybody knows about, and rightfully so, and discusses to things like the even more recent in history, the, you know, the cultural revolution and forced collectivization in China that was maybe 30, 40 million people who lost their lives. We have these black uh, holes of knowledge, and I think sometimes in my darker moments, I think that that's because people deliberately don't want to know about particular things because they go against their own tribal belief systems and don't want to confront them. Actually, in my even darker moments, I think that people are doing something like a, a version of the kids game of, of peekaboo, right, where you can kind of cover your eyes and then it makes that bit of history go away or be something that you don't have to recognize or contend with because, you know, we're just not talking about it or seeing it and teaching other people about it. But then in my less dark moments, I just see it as 
the culture that we have at this particular time has decided that this is worth knowing about and this other thing either isn't or it's just that those other things are so interesting to us that they take up all the oxygen as far as our ability to, you know, to breathe in all of this information. I think maybe some combination of those things is true. And it's also true that, especially when it comes to something like the Encyclopedia Britannica, everything gets filtered through a lens of, is this culturally, is this so in my discussion with Sandra Singlow about the a book Class by Paul Fussell, we talked about the ways in which knowledge is actually in part a function of what class you're part of. People at this level of class believe certain things and know certain things to be true, and people at lower levels uh, in the uh, class hierarchy know other things to be true and believe other things about the universe. And certainly you encountered in your reading that certain topics are considered worthy of a huge amount of attention. I think you mentioned something like chamber music and so forth, right? Um but probably a not a lot of entries about, you know, K-pop or whatever, right? There's That's low culture uh, or country music, right? There may be an entry or two about them, but you're going to get way more rich detail about 18th century Baroque whatever than you are about something that the masses might have been interested in, even though it's not clear that one of those is more historically relevant than the other or interesting than the other, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's true. Uh, wait, I have two things to say on that. Um, first, yeah, it is very bizarre what what is considered high culture and culture worth knowing. It's very arbitrary, and it changes. You know, I, uh, Melville, Herman Melville, when he died, was a relatively obscure uh, you know, Moby Dick was not considered the greatest novel ever. And I forget, uh, I'm going to be epistemically humble and I forget how it happened, but I think there was one professor, a Harvard professor perhaps, who wrote uh, a defense uh, of Moby Dick and that, and that sort of vaulted it. But, it, you know, these things go in and out of style. Thomas Paine, I remember reading about him and how his reputation waxed and waned. And, you know, he died pretty poor and obscure and no one paid much attention. And now he's considered one of the great founding fathers. Uh, so that's what I agree with you on that. I wanted to say one other thing about our black holes of knowledge. I was talking about this with my wife because she asked, why do we study so much about World War I, you know, until the pandemic, we knew so little about the Spanish flu. When uh, the Spanish flu killed whatever estimate, 20 million people, uh, so as much or more than World War I. And it's a great question. And I think part of it goes to what you say. One is, it's a better story. You know, conflict between humans is more exciting than people being wiped out by an unseen germ. I'm reading the, a book on the Spanish flu, and governments actively suppressed knowledge about the flu at the time because they didn't want to uh, have people lose faith and uh, you know morale during World War I. So it's a combination of factors. But I think a lot of it goes back to the Discovery Channel, like what's exciting, and, uh, and that is people killing each other in trenches, unfortunately, is more exciting to us. And more visually appealing, certainly, for TV to show the, you know, the, the people in the trenches or the wastelands that those places became than someone just, I guess, dying in a sickbed. Yes, exactly. I'm, I mean, it's why we are so excited about shark attacks, but the estimated 100,000 deaths in hospitals from internal hospital infections, like that does not get until the pandemic, that did not get the coverage of one shark attack. That's a really interesting point there, and I think it it may be actually a stumbling point for us collectively that we have a hard time focusing on the problems that are deeply important and could be deeply impactful, but that aren't 
sexy because, you know, you couldn't make as gripping a movie like Jaws as you could about, you know, about people getting infected in hospitals by, you know, by, by diseases. Maybe you could, <laughs> but, you know, at least it doesn't, it doesn't loom as large in our brains as something that excites us in a, in a general way. And that, I think that does hold us back collectively in some sense because it's very often the case that those things would have a much greater impact on on our rising up as a as a species overall than say eliminating all shark attacks. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's a huge problem, maybe one of the biggest we have. And I think climate change is an example. Uh, like until recently, yeah, it was a very hard to visually tell an exciting story about climate change because it was slow moving. And, it, uh, you know, there is no villain. There is no one serial killer. Uh, now, maybe, uh, you know, if you believe that the wildfires are the, due to climate change. You know, I definitely believe in human-made climate change. I'm not, not as sure of how it links to disasters because I'm not an expert on that. But if you do believe, you know, the wildfires are caused by climate change, you know, that's a pretty stark visual. That's a pretty compelling visual. So I think that will motivate more people. That's that's really interesting to me. The, uh, the climate change thing is fascinating to me in general. I'm much more skeptical of it, especially skeptical of the idea that there's not just an overall trend, but that human beings are creating a catastrophe, an absolute disaster waiting to happen. So I, I analyzed the data myself about five or six years ago and um, and wasn't as impressed as, as other people are about the case. But also one of the things that factored into my thinking the most was what you mentioned about there's always being more diversity than you think. We look back at the climate record as we have it and it looks much more stable than I think it really was. In fact, I'm sure of that. This is a measurement problem. It's like if you ask someone to measure the length of a coastline and you give them a globe, they're going to come up with a much lower number about, you know, how many miles of of coast is there on the east coast of the U.S. than if you had someone who had a map of higher resolution and they would come up with a different number than someone who was you asked to actually get down there and walk along the shoreline and you know and try to record it they would describe the coastline as much much more jagged and varied than uh, than the person who has that kind of satellite, uh, very low resolution view. And when we look back at the past and at the past record, that's what we see. We see a simplified story of what the climate looked like in the past. If we were actually living through it, then we would see days that were, you know, extraordinarily hot and extraordinarily cold and swings that are not fully captured by the records that we have in a short, you know, in trees and in other things that we use in a secondhand way to try to get at what that evidence is. Not to say that human beings aren't affecting the, the climate or that it couldn't be real, but that our view of the record of the past is... It's we predict the past, and when we predict it, we smooth out that prediction and pretend that there's not an error bar or pretend that it was less, as you say, less diverse than it really was. There was a lot of variation and diversity there that gets covered up by time. Well, let me, uh, let me give pushback a little on that cause, and uh, defend the mainstream view about climate change. You know, I did a book about the Bible, and I uh, went down to the Creationist Museum in uh, Kentucky, which is staffed by people who believe the world was created 5,000 years ago, and they reject the theory of evolution. And now these are very smart people, but because of their preconceived notion that— um, uh, you know, the Bible is correct. They are able to find very compelling science, and I put that in quotes, that, uh, you know, evolution is a hoax. And they, you know, if I am in a one-on-one -on -one argument with them, they would probably win that debate of evolution versus creationism because they spend all their time studying it. And um, I just accept the mainstream 
scientific opinion uh, of 99% of scientists or whatever that evolution is real. So that's the way I like to think about climate change. You know, I am not an expert. And even if I did spend six months looking at the data, I don't think I have the background and statistics to really know. So there is, there is a danger in the heuristic of trusting 97%. Which, of, which is actually not a, a real figure if you dig into that. 90% of them had a neutral or a particular, and it was a specific subset. At any rate, that, that figure that seems very certain is, um, is a bit, let's just say, overplayed. It could be. I'm going to plead epistemic humility on that because I, I didn't dig in. But anyway, I do think that in this case, a good heuristic is to trust a mainstream science. It's not a perfect heuristic, but especially in this case, the, um, the downside of not trusting it, I think, is huge. Because say even if it's a 50% chance that they're right and that this could cause really disastrous consequences, even if it's just a 50% chance, shouldn't we put a huge amount of energy into fighting it? Yeah, that's one of the most interesting arguments out there. Do you know uh, Pascal's wager? I do, I do. Yeah, for the listeners, the idea of uh, Blaise Pascal, one of the founders of uh, probability theory and early mathematician, among other things, he was wondering whether he should believe in God. And he came to the conclusion that, yes, he should believe in God, because even though if he thought there was a very, very small percentage chance that it was true, acting as if he believed in God, if there was an actual God, would save him from an eternity of torment. And the value of that was so high that conforming, it, you know, all he would lose was his life as far as living a pleasurable life or whatever it was by conforming to what he felt like God would want, whereas if he was wrong, the impact would be an eternity of suffering. And when you weigh those two things together, obviously you want to go in the direction of the one that even if it's very unlikely would have the most devastating impact if it were true and try to mitigate that uh, and keep it from happening is a very interesting argument and deeply wrong in some ways. Not that his line of thinking was incorrect, but that it omitted certain things. And the thing that it omitted is, I think, the same thing that people don't really like to talk about when it comes to the climate change thing, which is that putting all of your energy into preventing a particular thing from happening has an opportunity cost. And that opportunity cost could be huge. And you don't know whether there are other possible future scenarios that could be just as impactful and horrible that you should really be putting, I guess, all your eggs in that basket or all your attention into that one. We saw this with the pandemic. Everybody rushed to build ventilators. Oh my God, we need ventilators to stop this horrible problem of everybody dying in hospital because they don't have ventilators turns out that all of that energy that went into that was for naught, right? That that wasn't the solution. So you can see a scenario, a complex scenario, and especially, and I think this gets at something that you were saying about when you've got this data and you're looking at it, especially nowadays, you've got a lot of data, that data is noisy. You can come up with any particular story that you want out of that. Some of those are going to be more backed up by the facts than others, but you can tell just about any story and you can get yourself worked up about just about any particular danger you want. Decide that you need to throw all of your resources into preventing that one thing from happening. And while you're doing that, not lose track of all of the bad things that happen because you put all of your energy into, you know, into the wrong side of Pascal's wager if it happens to go the other way. Right. Um, I know there was a lot there, so I'll let you, you know, respond. No, I, I'm very interesting. I would say that uh, I don't 100% buy the analogy that this is like Pascal's wager. And to me, Pascal's wager is wrong because there's no evidence in my, no scientific evidence for God. It is all based on faith. So 
I agree with you. You've got to look at when deciding to do something, you look at what scientific evidence do we have, how reliable is it, and then what are the possible opportunity costs, what are the unknowns, what are the unexpected consequences that might be bad. And to me, climate change, again, falls into the category of, you know, if, if you believe in science, then, then this is going to, this has the potential to be bad. Um, but yeah, Pascal's wager, I think, again, there, you're just going on faith. So you shouldn't wager your life on faith. You should wager it on evidence. And the other problem with Pascal's wager, of course, is that uh, it doesn't take into account the hundreds of other gods. Absolutely. Yeah, no, there, there are so many other potential alternate scenarios. Why shouldn't he be worshiping the Muslim god or whatever else it is, right? Why not that one? Right. Or Poseidon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why not, you know, obscure gods? Like, who's to know that he shouldn't uh, put all his eggs in that basket? So uh, I actually, I've thought a lot about Pascal's wager. Like, what would be the most, if you were going to follow that, what would be the most rational wager and would it be Christianity because that currently has the most number of people? Would it be animism because that's the most belief over all of human history? Some you can believe in at the same time. Some you can't. Like you can't believe in Christianity and Islam because they are uh, at the same time because they are exclusive. But, you know, I think there are some that you could believe in at the same time. So maybe that is a way to do it. So, yeah, there are a lot of uh, interesting things about Pascal's wager, but I don't think, to me, it translates to the the climate change. I I get what you're saying, especially about the fact that there is, you know, there's scientific evidence for one, and I don't doubt that there is uh, evidence for it, just that it comes in uh, the form of very noisy data that doesn't compel you to come to that uh, particular conclusion. At least I, I analyzed it, as I say, maybe five or seven years ago, the data, and uh, found it to be also compatible with the theory of essentially a random walk of temperatures where things are going up and down, especially when you take into account the idea that the past may be much more variable than we think it was. Uh, in terms of that idea of the, you know, the diversity of the past. Given that you mentioned the religion thing and the the multiple gods thing, and you had written that other book, what is your thought on the idea that the Bible actually lives in a universe where there are multiple gods, like internal to the logic of the Old Testament is the idea that the universe itself has multiple gods, and this one particular god just wants to be your your exclusive one. Right, that is fascinating because, as you say, in, early in the Old Testament, at least, it, you shall have no other god before me. But it doesn't say there are no other gods. It's just like this is the CEO god, this is the top god, and you should worship him. And everyone else is on a lower level. And again, the Bible. I think one important realization I had is not it's not a monolith. Even the Old Testament, you know, there were dozens of writers over hundreds of years. So I'm sure some of them were monotheistic in the way that we think of now, but some were more polytheistic. And I've actually thought about this in reference to, you know, good or bad. What are the pros and cons of monotheism versus the pros and cons of polytheism? Because polytheism, in a sense, is it's much more interesting, like the the Greek gods are much more interesting. It's more like a soap opera. Uh, you know, they're they're all cheating each other. They have flaws and they're, you know, they're all these dramas. And one thing I do like about monotheism, and I'm not a believer in God, but one consequence of monotheism is, is the idea that we are all God's children. You know, this was a sea change from the idea that, you know, some people like Egyptian pharaohs were gods and everyone else was was human. So it's it's like a very uh, hierarchical. There are there are different types of humans, and some are more holy than others. Whereas in monotheism, there is just one God, and everyone else is equal. And that I think is a very nice message. Uh, you know, I, I I don't think you have to believe in a single God to have that message, but it might have been a very useful message in terms of human history. Interesting. It's interesting that you bring that up too, in terms of the how 
you don't see yourself uh, n- even now as as religious. The idea then of the kind of fake it till you make it <laughs> uh, perspective obviously didn't rub off in at the end of your year of living biblically. No, I mean, well, I will say uh, religion again is a complicated thing. There, one of my spiritual advisors broke it up into the three Bs. So in religion, you have belief belonging and behavior. So belief in God or gods, belonging, being part of a community, and behavior, which can mean either the rituals you practice or the ethical behavior that the religion encourages. And I certainly don't have the first B, belief. Uh, You know, I'm agnostic slash atheist. But I do see that there can be advantages to the second and third B, and I'm not a believing Jew, but I do sometimes enjoy the rituals of getting together with the family, uh, you know, for Seder, or doing a Sabbath, a Shabbat, where you try not to work for a day, which is very hard in our iPhone era. I am agnostic, not only about God, but whether religion has been good or bad for humanity. You know, there are some great things like the abolition movement that were very religion-fueled, um, but of course the Crusades and, and dozens of other you know, fundamentalist terrorists. It's hard to say whether religion overall has been good or bad for the world. I wouldn't clump religion as all one concept. I say, you know, there are different parts of religion, belief, belonging, and behavior, and some are better than others. But certainly religion can encode some ways of life that are good or practices that seem wise, like taking a, a day off, something that I too sometimes aspire to and occasionally achieve uh, <laughs> as far as a, a regular kind of, especially I'd love to be doing more of a tech Sabbath in my life, uh, but that's that's fairly challenging. Were there, getting back to the know all were there any um, cultural practices that you thought to yourself, oh, I should adopt that particular one um, and see if I can uh, make that a ritual in my own life? Well, there is. I did love, uh, you, you might know that when Roman emperors came back from a victorious campaign, they had their triumphal march, their triumphal parade, and they were on a chariot. But they always had a slave whispering in their ear behind them, uh, you are mortal, you are going to die. And the idea was don't get too cocky. You know, it was sort of an, uh, a hedge against... Uh, them megalomania. And I love that. I think I would love to have someone you know, whispering in my ear about my mortality. You know, this whole idea of the uh, memento mori, the reminder of death. Uh, so it wasn't just that, it was also in medieval paintings. I think that's a very powerful way to appreciate the moment and to remember that, you know, life is fleeting and Maybe don't sweat the small stuff and and try to enjoy the few moments we have here on Earth. So I guess that would that would be one uh, one of my favorite rituals from the past. So, so we should all put a, a skull on our desk uh, so we know. Oh, I actually do. I have a skull not on my desk but on my desktop. Uh, It's a little JPEG. I didn't want to go with a creepy skull, so it's sort of like a colorful psychedelic skull, but. Uh, it's my memento mori. Before uh, wrapping up and to wrap up perhaps on something other than death, although that's a good final topic, I suppose, <laughs> uh, I want to sure. ask you one uh, final question and not to put too much pressure on you, but I'm going to judge your entire encyclopedia reading project <laughs> based on how quickly you can answer this question, uh, which also <laughs> happens to be my favorite crossword puzzle hint of all time. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay, here it is. Who was Chang's closest relative? <laughs> well, physically closest, I suppose, was Ang. Yes. E N G. <laughs> Chang and Ang. Yeah, they. Are, I have a section on Chang and Ang in the in the Know It All, and I I don't remember everything, but I do remember that, and it was an extraordinary story because they were the original Siamese twins in the 1800s. They worked for P. T. Barnum. They were an inspiration about the adaptability of humans because they got they both got married, and they would spend one night at one house, uh, and then they moved to the other wife's house for the next night. And, uh, you know, just they had kids, so they obviously did something. And that is, you know, can can you imagine the awkwardness of, you know, when you're 
brother is going at it. And like, what do you do? Are you reading, you know, the newspaper? What's going on? But I, but they did it. They they had this incredible uh, stumbling block in their life, but they made it work. So bringing things all back around, uh, does that make you reconsider the possibilities of uh, polygamy as a way of life? Was that what they were doing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. I guess the women would know who was on the right and the left, so it would be pretty hard to uh, fool them. But I would say, uh, yeah, again, polygamy is an interesting idea, but it is definitely not for me. I am, I am happy to be a monogamist, and again, not out of ethical problems, but just, oh, it's exhausting. Like ha- I, I met with some people in the polyamory committee and looked at their Google calendars, and they are, it's just filled with, you know, it looks like a a tapestry. It's, there's so many different dates and who approves of what. And it's, uh, so yeah, I, to simplify my life, I'm happy to be a monogamist. AJ, thanks so much for coming on The Filter. Thank you, Matt. Good to be here. Thanks for listening to The Filter with Matt Asher. You can find show notes at thefilter.org or follow user Matt Asher on the socials. 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 Socials.